Hello and welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield and this is a podcast about the people behind the positions in our very divided public conversations. Every episode I speak to someone who has some kind of public voice or platform. And rather than starting with the issues on which we might disagree, I invite them to reflect on their own values, their vision of the good life, the principles that have led them to the conclusions that they have reached. I speak to people from all points on the political compass and a huge range of religious and non-religious positions. We've had people on from both sides of almost all of our most controversial topics. And we're doing it because we think it's important to build empathy across these tribes. We live in divided times as the cliche now goes. And I am convinced after five years of doing this, that it helps. It helps to try and listen with curiosity in a non-adversarial setting to people who might be from different tribes from us, who people, to people who might disagree with us on some very, very deep things. I think it's the only way, this practice as citizens, as people, is the only way we're going to hold together. And so if you're new to the podcast, you can look back over our previous episodes and you will find in that list people that you feel instinctively really warm to and think, oh, I'd love to hear what they think. And people who you feel instinctively repelled by and really don't want to listen to. Because in our curated, algorithm-driven media age, we are constantly fed content from people like us or occasionally content from people not like us framed in a way designed to make us angry. So I would encourage you to listen to both types, people like you and people not like you, and just see what happens. Before I introduce today's guest, I have some very exciting news. For the first time since before the pandemic, we are hosting a sacred live event. We haven't done this since 2019 when we had Richard and Lydia Iwade on in the Curzon Cinema in central London. Many of you came and we had such a great, great time. And I'm really looking forward to being in the same geographical space as many of you curious and thoughtful and engaged and very diverse listeners to The Sacred. And for this event, we are going to have an interview with Oliver Berkman. Oliver is perhaps most famous for his long-running column in The Guardian, which was called This Column Will Change Your Life. And he is known for being this um, very human, very thoughtful, very sane voice on the kind of self-help universe and what actually does help us live a wiser, more connected, more loving, more productive lives. His most recent book is, he's written many, many books, uh, but his most recent book is called 40,000 Weeks and it's about how we use time really well and I would highly recommend it. So I'll be interviewing him and uh, we will have opportunities for you to engage with other listeners, to have deeper conversations, to reflect on your values. We will have drinks available. I hope it will just be a really lovely, um, meaningful, but also fun uh, night out. It'll be in central London and that's going to be on the 19th of April. Bookings will open quite soon. So do follow us on our social media channels because quite a small venue. We want it to feel intimate and cozy and like people can really get to know each other. So uh, don't hesitate. If you want to come, make sure you book quickly. And I would say it's a great event to bring a friend to, someone who you want to invite into a deeper kind of conversation, who you'd love to be um, talking about values with, talking about what our beliefs are. Um, Do bring them along to that. Try and maybe book two tickets. 19th of April. Look out for more details. So this episode is with Catherine Burblesing. Catherine is a lifelong educator. She uh, is a head teacher of Michaela Community School in West London. She's also known, uh, and this is the title of the ITV documentary that was made about that school, as Britain's strictest headmistress. And she is certainly outspoken in her um, beliefs about what a kind of educational approach should be. Um, we spoke about the philosophy of Michaela's school, about the um, the frameworks that they've put in place to bring it to a stage where it really it, it has Ofsted, Ofsted outstanding um, rating. And what drives that? And I was really interested to hear kind of her parenting philosophy from her dad and then the journey she's taken from being a kind of student Marxist and a lefty teacher to now what she described as a small C conservative. We discussed her motivation around children who are um, from higher need backgrounds and what she's learned about engaging across divides. I really hope you enjoy listening and there are some reflections from me at the end as usual. 
Catherine. I am appalling at small talk. So I'm going to give you no warm up whatsoever, uh, but invite you to join me in um, a little bit of uh, dive in the deep end into depth. And I like to ask people what is sacred to them. And it doesn't have to be in any particular religious frame. For most people, it's not. In fact, it's a way of trying to get to the deep principles or the values that are precious to you, that you have tried to live by, that have informed your life. And it is one of those questions that I think um, we don't often know. It sits with us and bubbles up over time. So uh, almost everyone's answer is a kind of grasping towards a sense of something. But having had very little time to ponder on what might be sacred to you, some sacred values that you've tried to live by, what bubbles up for you? Truth is my first thought. I mean, when you say that about what's sacred, I want to say children, really, Um, because, uh, you know, children are the future. And I don't think any, many of us as adults don't really understand that point, even though we sort of say it, or at least Whitney Houston said it, Um, Mm. you know, uh, and truth about children and our roles that we uh, should be playing, you know, our duty towards children um, as adults, as their teachers, as their parents, as just adults in the community, uh, and that truth matters. Um, And I don't think people um, understand that we have a role to play. I think sometimes children can be entertaining for us. Um, we, we like them because they're fun and they, they make us laugh and they see things in different ways and they're cute and they make us feel needed um, and worthwhile. But actually, it, it, it shouldn't be about how we feel. It should be about our, our job, our role uh, in how we develop them and how we prepare them for the future and how we prepare the future of our country, of our families, of our schools, of our communities. Um, And that requires adults who get the job, who understand what they're meant to be doing. And that's when truth comes into it because the fact is it's just not true, this idea. I mean, I've said it um, before and got into lots of trouble about it. Um, It's just not true that all children are good. You know, in fact, I'd say that all children need to be taught to be good (laughs) and that if you just let a child go, they'll be naughty. Um, And that doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that if you leave them to it, they'll eat loads of chocolate and they'll go on social media and watch TV and they'll never do anything with their lives. Now, of course, those are older children, but even with younger children, you know, uh, a toddler will hit other children to take the toy that he wants. Um, He'll, you know, he won't say thank you or please and that sort of thing. Of course he won't until you've taught him how. Um, And yet when people, you know, I got into big trouble for uh, tweeting once about original sin. And I mean, I wasn't even, I just said, yeah, original sin. You know, it was just just a two second thing that I tweeted out and the whole world went mad. And the thing is, I'm not even a Christian. But I'm just saying, look, isn't this obvious? Isn't it obvious that we'd all rather um, eat chocolate than broccoli? We'd all rather, you know, last night I thought I need to do my body pump. And I should have done my body pump and I didn't. Instead, I sat down and I had some chocolate digesters. In fact, you can see the chocolate digesters here that I've got on my table here. You know, like, obviously. And that's because, you know, my 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 nature got the better of me, you know? Mm. and um. That doesn't mean I'm a terrible person. It just means that I know I'm having to work against that nature all the time. And when we believe that children uh, are just naturally good, um, it's just, it's not true. It's not true and it doesn't help them. And it's only by teaching them right from wrong and giving them a moral framework that they can then develop a moral core so that when they are my age and have to decide between doing their body pump or sitting down and eating some chocolate digestives, they will make the better choice. You know, um, yeah. and that, that is how you determine the future of your country, the future of the people in your country, uh, the values that you teach your children. So, I mean, in terms of what else is sacred, you know, teaching children personal responsibility, 
teaching them that they have a sense of duty towards others. That as you grow up, you know, you, you have a duty as a brother or as a sister, as a son or as a daughter. You have a duty towards your mother to behave in a particular way, to do as she asks you to do. You have a duty towards your teachers to do as they ask you to do. You have a duty to yourself to fulfill your talents, but you also have a duty to your parents and to, your, to the people in your lives, like your teachers and so on, who have helped you to do the best that you can. Because if you don't do the best that you can, then you're taking them for granted and you're taking what they've done for you for granted. Um, so uh, all of, there's, there are lots of small C conservative values is what I call them, that we teach our children here. Uh, having high expectations of yourself, um, having uh, seeking purpose in life. You know, mm -hmm. we don't teach our children to get great GCSEs so they can go out and be billionaires. I have no interest in them becoming billionaires. I want them to be able to fulfill their talents and to find purpose. And the only way in which you find purpose is identifying the sorts of things that you want to develop in yourself and that you find, um, eh, you know, interesting, something that you feel you could do for your li with your life, some way of contributing to the world so mm -hmm. that you are engaging with the world and with your life. You're not just like a paper bag being blown in the wind one way or the other way. You actually believe in something. So. Um, that's really yeah, helpful. Those are the kinds of things that all of that is all about is, 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 is to do with children, you know, yeah. and what we should be teaching them and how we should be looking after them. And to point out to your audience that you're not doing children any favors by indulging them in victimhood, by, um, indulging them in their, in complaining or feeling entitled. You want to be able to teach them gratitude for whatever little they have so that they can live a life of meaning. That is what's important here. Um, yeah. And I think too often people think that grades at school or um, uh, getting your GCSEs or, or whatever it is that teachers may be asking you to do is about getting some, a job. It's not about getting a job. It's about yeah. having purpose and real yeah. meaning in your life. Thank you. There's so much I'd like to come back to you there, not least it's making me think about Rousseau and a kind of tabula rasa, the sort of... Uh, very romantic idea of a child and how contrasting that is with what you've said and how dominant it is. But first I want to talk about you as a child. I want to get an understanding of what your childhood was like. And um, can you paint me a little bit of a picture, particularly around any big ideas that were formative, political, philosophical, religious, anything uh, that helped shape the woman you are today? But just tell us a little bit of that story of Catherine as a child. Yeah, well, I grew up uh, in a Caribbean household. I mean, I grew up mainly in Toronto, but my mother's Jamaican, my father's Indian Guyanese. And, um, so we grew up with Caribbean food and Caribbean friends and family and all that kind of thing. Uh, and my father, I mean, my mom, mom too, but he set the tone in terms of politics. So he's very much, very left wing. Um, you know, the conservatives were always evil. Everybody understood that. Um, and I think they wonder what's happened to their daughter because there's no way I would be voting for Labour these days. Although, you know, I've all, I'm a floating vote voter. So if they were to change their values, and actually if they were to change their values back to what the left used to have as their values, because the point is, it's, it might, people might think, how come you grew up in this lefty household? And then you think the way that you do now. That's because my parents had very small C conservative values. Hmm. And that's because in the day, people on the left had small C conservative values. But those small C conservative values have almost disappeared from the left. So it's only p people of my parents' age, who are now in their 80s, who are still very much on the left, but still traditional in their way of thinking. Hmm. So that was, you know, so we were always you know, we always had to eat everything on our plates because there were people who were starving in Africa or whatever it was. We had to eat everything. We had to be grateful for what little we had. My sister might've been wearing my hand-me-down clothes, but we were grateful for the fact that I had clothes in the first place. Everything mm. was just, we were always scrimping and saving. And part of the reason why we were scrimping and saving was my father was always bringing his family over from Guyana. So poorer family who, you know, brothers and sisters of his and so on. He was the one... Uh, of the brothers and sisters who had kind of got out, as it were. So mm -hmm. he was the bright one, and he had got a scholarship to the, the local private school, and then he'd gone off to university, and he was the major success. 
And the, the kind of understanding when that happens, because they're all scrimping and saving at the time to buy his uniform, and they're sacrificing in order to help him. Mm. So the idea is that when he gets wherever he gets to, he's going to help them in return. So yeah. our whole lives, we were always filled in the house with various family who were being brought over. This is in Canada. They were being brought over from Guyana. Um, and we were trying to find them jobs in McDonald's or as a dental hygienist or whatever. You know, you were just trying to get them various jobs and various qualifications so that they could better themselves and get, get a better life. Yeah. Um, and so I would always watch these them come and they would see snow for the first time. And it was always amazing. So there was a real sense in me of helping other people, helping family, sacrificing. Because, of course, we sacrificed financially massively in order to help, uh, you know, because my father would have to go out and rent them an apartment, for instance, and he'd have to, you know, all the stuff that we used to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, that that was me growing up. I mean, I went to normal state schools in Toronto, and then I came to a state school here. We moved here when I was 15, uh, but I say we moved here. My parents were here for a year, and yeah. then we went back to Canada. I then stayed on and then I ended up just staying and staying. And the idea was I'd stay an extra year, then another year. And then yeah. I just never left. So I'm still wow. here. That's quite young to be um, fully independent. Were you boarding or something? How did you make it work? No. So when I was 15, of course, it was a year here with my parents. Right. Then I was 16 and I was halfway through my A-levels at the time. And Canada has a different system. So I wouldn't right. have been able to go back and do my A-levels. So the idea was, let me just stay here and finish the A-levels. And then... I used to babysit for this family and they had a room they could rent out. And so I, I just rented that room yeah. and stayed with them for that year. How was it? Oh, I've always been very independent. So, you know, when I was 10, I mean, this is a nice story in terms of, it tells you what my character is like. Um, I mean, I was quite a naughty child. You know, my sister was always very quiet and well-behaved. I was not. And, um, you know, there were photographs of when I was little, you know, when I was about four with baby powder all over me and all over the floor, because I've gone and found the baby powder and I've put it everywhere. Um, and when I was 10, you see, my father, who was very strict, you know, he was a small C conservative and he found that we were watching too much television. And, uh, and he used to take the wires out of the TV at the back. I mean, obviously this is the 1980s. So there were all these, it was a big fat TV with all these wires. And, um, and then I was quite clever and figured out how to, how to, how to, I don't know, make it to get different wires or whatever. And then we would, when he'd go out, my sister and I would watch and then he'd come back in. Yeah, exactly. He'd come back in and then we would quickly turn it off and then sit there with a book. <laughs> and then he'd go and feel the back of the TV and it was warm. And so he knew. <laughs> so he called up my cousin James and said, James, you're going to get a TV for, you know, an early Christmas present. And he took no! the television. Exactly. But he, he was a good man. My father was a good man. And he took the TV to James's house. We didn't have a TV. Now, I used to deliver newspapers. Um, at that time, just once a week. But then eventually I graduated to every day. And um, I had my own money because I'd obviously earned from this paper round that I had. And I thought, right, well, I'm going to go off and get my own TV. So I went to the newspapers, the classified ads. I mean, remember, I'm 10 years old, so I have no idea what I'm doing. I look in the newspaper and I'm looking for the cheapest possible TV because I can't afford any of these TVs. It's paper round money. <laughs> exactly. But I did have enough for $60. And there was a, there was a TV advertised for $60. And I thought, well, I, can, I have enough for that. I can get this. Rang up the guy. He said yes, but he was in Brampton. Now, Brampton's an hour, maybe an hour and a half or something outside of Toronto. And I thought, right, well, I need to find a way to get to Brampton. So off I went to the Go bus station. In fact, this is the only time in my life I've ever taken a Go bus in Canada. <laughs> and um, I got on this Go bus. So it's like getting on a bus to Oxford or something from London. And I... A 10-year-old. I know, it was mad. And, and then off I went to Brampton. And it, I was quite lucky because I got off and at the first stop in Brampton... And then when I remember going into this pizza joint and asking them for this address and they said, oh, it's just around there. So it was actually next door, which was great. So I walked over and knocked. And when I when the guy opened the door, obviously, by this time, my father is in a panic because he can't find me. And he's found the newspaper classified ads and he's found me writing down numbers and all the rest of it. So he's um, he's 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 rung up the guy 
found that his daughter's on the way. The guy says, look, you need to stay here until your dad gets here. So my dad arrives. And this is where the genius of my father, I tell you, he never said a word because I was terrified. I was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be in so much trouble. He doesn't say anything. He allows me to pay my $60. He puts me in the car. He puts the TV in the car. Now, you got to understand, this TV is about, I don't know, it's no more than 10, oh, it's 10 centimeters by 10, maybe 20 centimeters one. by twenty centimeters. I mean, it's tiny. Yeah. And it's this little black and white TV with this old fashioned aerial. I mean, yeah. and uh, he l- lets me go home with it. And then, of course, I plug it in and I'm trying to get it to work. And I get a couple of channels, which are all a little bit fuzzy because there's no cable or anything. And it's, you know, you can see some TV on it, but it really isn't that great. And um, he doesn't say a word. And then, well, three or four weeks later, I got bored of it and I stopped watching. So I always say that I won the battle, but my father won the war. <laughs> yes, that makes complete sense. Now, that kind of uh, perseverance is helping me understand how you uh, just went and opened a free school by yourself. But before we get <laughs> off your childhood, I want to just ask a bit about your mum, because I gather she, you've said that you aren't a Christian. I gather that she was. Is that right? Yes, she still is. Um, she, well, my parents, we grew up and we did go to church. So we went to church till I was about 12 or so. And then I'm a typical kind of teenager said, this is ridiculous. I don't do any of this. And so I stopped going. Um, and my father, they, they both still go to church. Um, my father's always been a lot more uh, conservative in his, and I don't mean that politically, I just mean yeah, theologically. His life. So he's always been to kind of a Presbyterian church. We went to a Baptist church for many years, and then we went to a Presbyterian church. My father now, for instance, goes to a Presbyterian. They've moved. They now live, you know, he goes to a Presbyterian church. My mother's uh, brothers sadly died, one of a heart attack, one of cancer in the early 90s. And when that happened and her father died at a very similar time, when that all happened, she became a born-again Christian. So she has always gone to more evangelical churches. Um, you know, so my mother is, is one of those people who will stand on the street corner and hand out leaflets and talks about Jesus and so on. Um, I mean, they're both quite old now, so if they do go to church, it's much more rare. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, for many years, she would have her 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 evangelical church that she went to and you know, yeah that's who she that is. makes sense i heard one of your friends just saying that you'd inherited a little bit of the come to jesus energy of your mom in that sense of like being a very <laughs> zealous person and yes. uh, wanting to share things do you mind me asking do you remember having a faith in your childhood and a point of losing it or was it always something that was just sort of you did with them but didn't feel like it was connected with you personally yeah, there's no question I believed in God and so on when I was little um, and Jesus and everything that I was told. It was just that when I got older, I started thinking, I'm not sure this makes sense, you know, uh, rationally, uh, how can God be Jesus and Jesus be his son? And how can it be that Jesus died and then he rose from the dead? That doesn't make any sense. You know, that, 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 that sort of stuff was what I was asking. And if you were to ask me now, I mean, I'm definitely not a Christian, but I do, you know, I always like to say, um, you know, I believe very much in, uh, in Jesus. So when I say I believe in him, I believe in his life. I believe in the values he taught. I believe in um, the person who he was. You know, if you want to try and imitate somebody, well, imitating Jesus is a pretty good option. So, uh, you know, I really like him. And I just sort of then say I don't necessarily believe in God. Now, look, I... Uh, what, what's interesting is that friends of mine who are religious and people who visit the school, for instance, will say, well, this is the most religious school we've seen and it's more religious than, than religious schools, you know? A, a friend of mine says that we do the human nature bit really right. We just don't do the grace bit. Uh, hmm. He's Catholic. And he will say that in many Catholic schools, um, while they do the grace bit right, they don't do the human nature bit right. And... Um, so, and what does he mean by that? We understand what human nature is, so mm-hmm. we address it properly, and that means children are able to grow up properly here. That makes sense. I often, I, when I write about sin, I try and write sin and forgiveness with hyphens so that we hold those concepts together. Right. And the fact that I just think it's a very generative thought that in society sometimes we're embodying too much forgiveness and sometimes we're embodying too much sin. and 
the the, the yes. for me as a Christian, the the truth requires the both held together. But anyway, that's a rabbit hole. You have painted a really helpful picture of your childhood. You went to Oxford and there's this story that goes around about you that you joined the Socialist Society. I gather you also joined a Conservative Society, right? What was going on with you at university? Well, You've heard a, uh, a friend of mine, childhood friend of mine, she said to me, oh, you joined. I, I might have written to her and said I was going to join. I never joined the Conservative Party, you know. Okay. Party. I mean, whatever. So you, you really were a sort of socialist or attempting to engage with it. I was. Oh, I was totally engaged with it. So I used to go along to some of their meetings. I don't know what it was. It might have been Marxist, Marxist meetings. I don't know exactly what the name was, but definitely there was a guy who used to sell living Marxism on the street. And I would meet up with him all the time because he happened to be where near where I lived. And I would talk to him and we'd get into various arguments about things. So, you know, I was always open to these ideas. I remember I was a lefty. So yeah. I might, I was just talking to the more extreme left. That's all. Um, and I wouldn't have not spoken to conservatives. I suppose I would have spoken to them, but I wasn't. The thing about Oxford is that the people who are conservative, and maybe this is the case in the world generally, they're sort of like Boris Johnson. And when I say Boris Johnson, I'm not even being critical of him. I just mean, or like David Cameron, you know, they go to these clubs where they have to drink gin out of a shoe and it's these boys clubs. Now, maybe they don't exist anymore, but in the day when I was there, they were these I think boys they do, clubs. sadly. Right. Well, they were these boys only clubs and they're drinking gin out of a shoe and they're just really obnoxious. And they are, they're all full of themselves and they've been to Eaton and Harrow and so on. And they're all like, look at us. And, um, and so you just would never mix with, I mean, somebody like me, I would never, I mean, I'm, I stay educated. I'm not, I, I would have nothing in common with any of these people. Um, and they're very much involved in the Oxford Union. Um, and they all want to be future politicians. That's the other thing. So they all get involved with the union. So they, we, you call them union hacks. And they're like, they're wandering around college, putting up posters, vote for me, vote for me. And they're trying to get your vote. And it's all just so distasteful as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but, um, so I was never going to have anything to do. You know, people always say to me, oh, you're going to be a politician. I'm like, you don't understand. I hate that sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so you were kind of involved in socialist ideas and avoiding the conservatives. When did it, at what point did it dawn on you? Or what, at what point did you start feeling that you might actually be the conservative person that you would now? Yeah describe yourself as. That's right. So that's, and that's a really good question because of course I grew up in a lefty household. I didn't sort of realize that there were conservative values in there, small C conservative values, not big C. Um, because you don't really think about that kind of thing. You're just growing up and then you go off and get a job. And I became a teacher because I was a lefty and I wanted to change the world. You know, it tended to be the case, certainly in the day then, if you were more of a right winger, you were going to go off and become a banker. You hung out with people at, in Oxford Union. You, um, you might have rode. <laughs> there were just there were certain activities that you did as that kind of tribal person. types. Yeah, and then there were the other types that just rejected all of that, and I was one of the ones that rejected it. And um, so I became a teacher. Uh, I was very much a lefty teacher. I believed all the stuff around the reason why black kids are underachieving is because of white racist teachers, because the system is racist, all this kind of stuff. And then I just started watching and looking and learning. And I'd see these white teachers working really, really hard for their kids. And I'd think, I don't think they're being racist. I think some of the kids are being rude to them and they're trying to deal with it. And I think some of the behavior is really poor that I'm seeing. And um, not necessarily just from black kids, just from all kids. And uh, I just started questioning all of the truths, so-called truths that I had been told. Um, I would go along to these uh, events that were set up by Diane Abbott at the time called Raising Black Achievement, and it would be a Saturday conference, um, and various people would talk about Raising Black Achievement. I remember taking along a friend of mine, well, a colleague of mine, a white guy who had been a PE teacher for, I don't know, 30 years or whatever. Then I suppose it was 20 years. I don't know. It was a long time. He was in his 50s. And... Uh, I, and there he was giving up his Saturday to go along and hear about Raising Black Achievement because I asked him to go. And uh, he would sit there being told by all of these presenters that white teachers were racist and that the reason why some of his black boys were failing was because of him. And I was so embarrassed. I was just mortified because I was thinking this guy has done his whole life to these kids and is sitting 
countless kids from, you know, we worked in a boys' school. It was in the inner city in South London. We were doing extraordinary things for the kids. And I, and he in particular, because he was an excellent teacher. I mean, he was fantastic. And I just thought, and the kids loved him. I mean, loved him. And sometimes I, I remember once um, we were in the car driving through Brixton and the um, uh, riots started to happen. There were some riots that were happening and, and there were a couple of his old kids who he'd once taught were there and he, and he had them jump in the car because he wanted to get them away from this dangerous situation. Like, this is the guy, this is the kind of guy he was. And I was so embarrassed to have taken him there. And I just thought, this is all so wrong. We're accusing all these white teachers and it's just not true. I mean, like, truth, remember what I said, you know, it's not true. And so I started to change my mind about what works in education. I started to realize that all the progressive nonsense that we've been told about Rousseau, as you mentioned earlier, all this goodness inside, they already, they, you just need to draw it out of the child instead of putting it into the child, um, is just wrong. If you don't tell a child that this is a triangle and this is a square, they're not going to know the difference. You can't take it out of them. You've got to put it in. And frankly, if you believe that you need to put it in all the time, because that is the progressive way of thinking, um, if you haven't put it there, then somebody else has. And that means that little Amy at home, who has uh, middle-class parents who talk about the politics of the day around the dinner table and take you to the Maldives and to various places on holiday, uh, you're le she's learning all that stuff. Uh, but little Johnny, who comes from a working class home, who doesn't go on holidays like that and doesn't read books at home and so on, he doesn't know this stuff. And that means the only person that's going to help Johnny overcome his circumstances is his teacher. And if his teacher thinks that she needs to draw the knowledge out of the children, then what's going to happen is Amy's going to answer all the questions. The teacher's going to be convinced that she's drawing the knowledge out of her because Amy is giving her the answers. And the teacher doesn't think, well, actually, it's because her parents taught her this because I didn't actually teach her. Johnny thinks he's dumb. Johnny gets kicked out of the class all the time. Johnny falls further and further behind. And that's the end of Johnny. And then we, we stamp him with a, 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 something saying he's special needs, etc. That is what happens to these children. And so I started noticing this. I changed my teaching methods. And I started to change my mind about my politics. I started listening a little bit more to what uh, the Labour Party had to say about education and what the Conservatives had to say about education. And I began to realize that I was agreeing more with what the Conservatives were saying than what Labour was saying. I was also writing a blog called To Miss With Love. Um, after To Serve With Love, you know, the book and then the Sydney Poitier film. And um, in the day, there was no Twitter. There was hardly any social media. There was just blogging. And people would go on the blogs and comment in the comment section. And that's how they had conversations. And I would realize that I kept on agreeing with all the conservative people on there. And I wasn't agreeing with the, the labor supporting people. Um... And I kept saying, they kept telling me I was a conservative. And I kept saying, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. <laughs> did I? You know, I, I'm just like you. Well, because I was convinced that if you were a right winger, you were a bad person. Um, and then slowly over years, I came to realize that I, I just didn't think like any of these uh, lefties on there, that mm -hmm. they would come on and make all these excuses for the kids. They would say it's because they're poor. Poor people can't behave. So that's why the kids mm -hmm. are misbehaving. You're expecting too much of them. I'm being too harsh. You know, the conservatives would come on and hold my values. And then I mm -hmm. thought, well, I suppose I'm a conservative. So then in 2010, I gave that speech that got me into a whole lot of trouble. That was like my coming out speech, really. Mm -hmm. I, I admitted to the world that I had voted conservative. You know, some yeah. weeks later, I met up with a friend of mine who, um, having, and she'd obviously heard my speech, and she leaned in across the table and she said, Catherine, I have something to tell you. I voted conservative too. <laughs> and that was the thing. I thought, oh my goodness, we're all like living in shame here. This is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. How was that experience building up to it? Were you nervous? Did you, yeah. Because it was, it was so seismic in your life. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But did you, did, were you scared about getting up there and saying what you said? Or did you just feel very fired up? Oh, no, I was scared. But I have to say, I didn't think I was going to lose my whole career. I mean, I didn't realize that. I was a bit naive. I didn't really understand what I was doing. I mean, um, I did know that what I was doing was naughty. <laughs> and I knew I shouldn't be saying this sort of thing out loud. I did know that. But I didn't think that I, I would be canceled because cancellation didn't exist then. Yeah. So now people are much more aware of the idea of being canceled. But then, remember, Twitter's only just started 
the whole concept around cancellation hasn't really, you know, mm. become a thing. So the idea that not only would I lose my job, but I would end up not being able to work in state education ever again was simply yeah. absurd, right? So yeah. I, I figured what I would do is I would go, I would speak, and then this will sound a bit idiotic, but remember, everything wasn't online then, right? Mm. So I thought, you know what, I'll go, I'll give my speech, and then I'll go back to school and nobody will know I gave it, you know? And yeah, if they weren't in the room. That's it. And I had been warned that it would go out on BBC, what's it Parliament. called? Pa- Parliament. BBC Parliament, yeah. yeah. BBC Parliament. And I thought, who watches BBC Parliament? And who watches <laughs> BBC Parliament? So I thought, right, well, it, 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 it'll go out, nobody will see it, and then I'll get on with my life. Yeah. Of course, I hadn't thought about the fact that once it's been recorded, it can be put up on YouTube and you can be seen over and over again. Now, and there's lots of journalists in that room. <laughs> and of course, I didn't have any idea about that because I don't know anything about... Because you're a teacher. Policies. I'm a teacher. All I ever did was mock. I didn't even know that there were... I didn't really understand that there were these political conferences. I didn't know... So when Michael Gove asked me to come along to the, to the conference, I was kind of like, well, what conference? Oh, I don't know. Okay, I'll go along to this conference. I didn't really know. So... I knew it was bad, but I figured it will just go out once. Nobody will see it. I'll go back to school tomorrow and it'll all be fine. Yeah. It did not occur to me that in the end, it, they my speech was watched more than the then uh, Prime Minister David Cameron's speech was watched, you know? Yeah. So I didn't realize. And then the other thing is, is that the main reason why it was watched, that's the other thing. I do think if I'd just gone back to school and, every, and just gone back to school, it would have been fine. Like it would have, uh, there were two, there were two articles the next day in the newspaper and then it would have been the end. The reason why it all became a big deal is because stupidly the school sent me home, right? It was just, yeah. it was just a bad decision on their part and that's fine. We all make bad decisions. They made a bad decision and because they sent me home, that's when the press went crazy. So right. they didn't go crazy initially because at the end of the day, well, it was just a speech from some teacher. I mean, yes, it, yeah. was, a bit, it, it was enough to get the attention of two newspapers the next day, right? Yeah. And they wrote about it. But then that would have been the end. Yeah. It didn't end because they sent me home. So then the Daily Mail and the various right-wing newspapers went mad. Teacher comes out, speaks at the Conservative Party conference, tells the truth, and she gets suspended. And mm. then that, that was the thing that then brought the energy and there were yeah. tons of journalists wanting to talk to me and they were at the school and they were outside my house and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it then became untenable for me to return. So yeah. I then had to resign. And then, and that's just because of the, the way the press handled it. It just became insane. Oof. But it was after that that it then became clear that no school was ever going to hire me because I had done the unthinkable. I had spoken at the Conservative Party conference. Yeah, that. Before I forget the thought, I just want to note to you that I think you just used the word naughty in a way that makes me think you have a little soft spot sometimes for naughtiness. <laughs> because <laughs> you oh, used it to me like a little bit scrappy, a little bit provocative. Look, whatever the kids get. Look, I always say they push, we push back. It's a game. So when they figure <laughs> out, they figure out some way around us holding them to account for their homework. They do something and I go, Damn, they're clever. <laughs> and then I think, okay, well, we got to move now. How are we going to get one step ahead of them? You know, it's a game. It's like yeah. my father. He won the war. You know, he, yeah. it, was a, it was a strategy of his. He thought, right, yeah. you know what? I'm going to let her have this TV because look at that TV. It's yeah. so rubbish. There's yeah. no way she's going to like watching that TV. He played yeah. a game. That's what you do as adults. You're constantly playing with them and you're trying to get one over on them. And then instead of allowing them to get one over on you. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I would just love you to say, so what's become really clear to me kind of reading reading your voice and listening to your voice is I think when people hear the phrase Britain's strictest headmistress and that you have kind of traditionalist philosophy of education, they can't help but associate it with kind of interwar boarding schools, right? <laughs> it, that strictness as an approach, and it, it isn't helped by the kind of conservative ministers who have been the face of it, just like association wise, is associated um, with basically posh schools. That's what it's associated with. But what's become clear, and I think in that speech was clear and elsewhere, is you are primarily motivated by children who are more likely to struggle at school. Could you just say a little bit more? You've, you've alluded to it, 
well, I mean, it's as you said, you know, they, they're kids, you know, they're, they're poor kids, they're ordinary kids here, they're inner city kids, you know. Um, it's a mix. Yeah, I mean, they're just in it, they're just normal inner city kids, and I, just like any inner city kid that, uh, school that I've worked at, you know. Um, and yet you come here and it doesn't feel like an inner city school at all. Uh, the kids are so polite. Frankly, I've had head teachers and deputy head teachers from top private schools who come here and they say, oh my goodness, your children would put ours to shame. They cannot believe how polite and how engaged they are and how interested in conversation they are and so on. So the thing is, why is it, you know, you say about, uh, you know, the kids at Eton or whatever, for instance, that they might get this type of education. So why should they be the only ones who should get this kind of education? You know, the assumption is that because you come from some rich family, therefore you're going to do well in life. You won't do well if you haven't had a good education. And those kids who go to those uh, more traditional schools get a good education, or at least they did get a good education. I don't know if those schools are still this way, to be honest. I think the modern way and progressive way of teaching has infiltrated everywhere, to be honest. And I think a number of those private schools that we might imagine uh, used to have a more traditional outlook no longer have a traditional outlook. Now, what does that traditional outlook look like? It just means not allowing kids to shout out in class and uh, be rude to the teacher. You know, do you really want your child to be in a classroom where the, ch- the teacher is being told to F off regularly? Do you really want other children throwing chairs around and running around the, 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 the corridors, screaming, punching each other, getting into fights, slamming doors, turning up to lesson 15 minutes late? Um, is that what we want? Or do we want children who are polite and engaged and, and really excited to learn? If you come and see our lessons, all the hands are up. They absolutely love learning. They also learn so much. Like, and obviously, if they're from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, the children, well, the only way they're going to change their stars is by gaining lots of knowledge and skills, right? It's kind of like a little goodie bag. In that goodie bag is all the knowledge and skills that children need to succeed in life. Why wouldn't you want disadvantaged children to have that? And I'll tell you why. There are a larger group of people who have been convinced by the narrative that um, allowing some children to have those opportunities is wrong if all children don't have those opportunities. So they feel uncomfortable with the idea of some schools being excellent, whereas not all schools are excellent. So, you know, John Prescott famously said, um, the Labour MP, Deputy Prime Minister, or whatever he was at some point, uh, said, um, he famously said, the problem with a good school is that everyone wants to go there. (laughs) You know, like, what he he was expressing in that moment, the sense of, well, everybody can't get to that good school, so it's not fair. And because the left value fairness and equality above all other values, They can only see everything through the prism of fairness and equality. And if everybody doesn't have it, then they really just want to stop some people from having it. It it makes them feel deeply uncomfortable. Um, And of course, the thing is, I would say that that everything is always going to be unfair. Like that's Mm -hmm. life. Life is unfair. There are always going to be some kids who have great parents and other kids who don't have such great parents. Some kids who get to go to a great school, some kids who don't. that doesn't mean that we want to stop everyone from having good things. We want to increase the number of good schools. And the only way you do that is by spreading good ideas. Um, because the power of bad ideas is huge within education. And I think people underestimate that. People on the left tend to just see it as, well, we need more funding. And if we got more money, then it would all be much better. But that has been proved incorrect over the labor years from 97 to 2010. They more than doubled the education budget from under 40 billion to over 90 billion. Um, And our PISA results didn't change in that time. Uh, The schools were exactly the same. So uh, the fact is, look, I'm very grateful for that extra money. Um, Very grateful because obviously more money does make a difference when you're doing the right things. So I'm not going to argue against any more money. But what labor then never addressed was the power of bad ideas. Uh, What I would say is that uh, the Conservative Party, as it has been, not necessarily now, but uh, under Michael Gove, he did very much, uh, you know, as Education Secretary, I mean, 
uh, he very much did address uh, a number of bad ideas in education, and that transformed the education system in this country for the better. Since mm. Michael Gove, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the case. Nick Gibb also played a huge part in this. Uh, he got phonics happening across the country. The problem is people have short memories, so they mm. forget that before 2010, phonics was not being taught in all schools. Like yeah. some schools did, some schools didn't. Uh, you know, like it really wasn't um, now because it's so normal. Everybody thinks, well, of course you teach phonics. Yeah. It was a battle for 20 years to get phonics taught in class in, in sc- classes. And there were serious lefties who were absolutely 100% opposed to it, despite the fact that teaching phonics helped disadvantaged children to read. You know? Yeah. And then you have to say, well, how can you... You say you're a lefty and you care about kids, disadvantaged kids, and yet you're trying to prevent the things that help disadvantaged kids succeed from happening. How does that work, you know? And that, that's what I always say to people, is just look at people's actions. Look at what they do. I was thinking about, you know, you had these very kind of wilderness years of not being able to get a job. And I gather receiving a lot of abuse um, and um, losing friends uh, yeah. between kind of the Conservative Party conference speech and setting up Michaela. Yeah. And then you set up this free school to kind of go, here's a laboratory. You know, I'm going to see if these ideas work. I, if I've got full control, can I put this kind of vision of education? Before you got your first Ofsted Yes. Outstanding result. Did you have a moment of like, oh no, <laughs> like what, what if it doesn't work? Or was it so clear to you from very early on that this was, the school was running how you wanted it to be running? I don't care about Ofsted. Ofsted didn't tell me that the school was good. It was just obvious. <laughs> it's obvious within the first week of the school starting. I mean, um, now obviously you want to keep that up so you don't know how it's going to go. So you're very keen on keeping the school moving in the direction that you wanted to move. But um no, I mean, I kept being told by the Department for Education that uh, anything could happen with our Ofsted. We could get the top score of a one or a four, which is the bottom score. You could get anywhere from a one to a four, Catherine. Yeah. And I said, well, there's obviously something wrong with the system of the inspectorate, isn't it? Like, I mean, how could it be that we could get from a one to a four? In any yeah. case, I completely ignore it. I don't care. Uh, yeah. I know what we need to do for these kids and we just get on with it. So, that's a great uh, and I think that's part of the reason why we are actually successful because I'm not scared. You're not second guessing it. Exactly. I just think, what do we need to do? And it's yeah. not just all coming from my head. Lots of the things we do here are ideas we've taken from other schools. My staff yeah. participate very much in developing the school into what it is. Um, yeah. We read books and find things from that. Um, one, the woman, Ruth Miskin, who helped get phonics across the country with her read write ink program she came here she gave me some advice and said she wanted us to do more turn to your partner that is something that happens across the school now and it's just embedded in in our culture you know like so even guests that came would give me Mm. advice and we would change things we've changed so much since we started but i would still say that within the first few weeks it was a completely different feel in the school than you might have in a more normal place so yeah, and we've just, we've got better and better and better. And now we're at a level where we look around. I mean, it really is, you know, when I go around, every time I go around the school and look in the classrooms, I always think this place is some kind of miracle. It's amazing. Well, it must be a lovely feeling. I um, I wanted to ask about, kind of, you, I've heard you say several times, strictness isn't mean. You know, being strict is not being mean. It's not being unkind. It's not being kind of completely devoid of compassion and empathy. And as I've been listening and reading um, about your work and listening to your voice, it feels to me like you almost have two modes. You have the kind of Joan of Arc, (laughs) scrappy, you know, fight for the truth mode. But you also, I've heard you be incredibly empathetic to why it's hard to change your mind on these things, why it's hard for teachers who are in progressive environments to teach differently why a lot of a, a lot of the kind of responses to um, impoverished students seem to make emotional sense. Could you just unpack a little bit when you use those two modes and 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 which do you think is most helpful actually for engaging across divides and for persuading people? Well, it depends on whether the person can be persuaded. Um, I do think there's a very small minority of people who have a vested interest in the system remaining the way that it is. They get something out of it emotionally. 
and they like the fact that there are kids who are disadvantaged who are failing. But they're a small minority. Um, I think the majority of teachers uh, just don't really know. So they don't know what's possible. So I was one of those teachers to a certain extent. Um, I just believed the rhetoric that poor kids cannot behave. Black kids cannot behave. Um, special needs kids cannot behave. It's a kind of prejudice against these kids to suggest that, well, it's just impossible to get good behavior from them. And not only good behavior, because I know people call me the strictest headmistress and all that because they concentrate on that because that's obvious, you know, the strictest thing. But actually, it's also about how we teach them. It's about the values of the school, teaching them gratitude and personal responsibility and all of that. Now, the thing is, if you've never been in an environment that teaches kids the right kind of values and has the highest of expectations for them when it comes to behavior, then you don't know that they can behave. Like, you've just never seen it. And actually, it turns out that mainly it is the black kids who are misbehaving or it mainly is the, the poor kids who are misbehaving. So you believe the rhetoric. It is the case that a poor kid cannot behave. It wasn't until I went traveling and would go into classrooms from China to India to South Africa to Jamaica to New York to Toronto, etc., cetera, France too. And I'd look around, especially in South Africa, for instance, or in India or in China, and I'd think, look at all these really, really poor kids, really poor, like far poorer than my kids in London. And yet they're behaving and there's 200 of them in the classroom and they've got broken chairs and broken tables and textbooks from 1974. And um, look at them all. They're just hungry for learning. So the rhetoric that I'm being told that you cannot behave if you're poor or you cannot behave if you're black, it's just not true. <laughs> it's just not true. So of course, if you haven't seen that, it's very hard to come to that conclusion. So I then started thinking, right, well, something else is going on here. And as I now understand fully, it's because the values that those kids are taught in those South African schools are very different and their families, very different to the ones that we're teaching our kids here in the West. So uh, it matters. Communities matter. What we tell our kids matter. It matters. You know, and I started off by saying this. We don't really think in detail about bringing up children. I think, for instance, people have children. They don't really think about what they're doing. They just have kids and, hey, they entertain us and whatever, and you give them a phone, and then that means you can chat to your friend at lunch, and you give them an iPad, and who cares, they'll be fine, and you don't really think, how am I going to get them reading before they start school? The number of times I put on Twitter about how what parents should be help, doing to help their children at school, the response I get is, I'm not meant to teach my child, this teacher is meant to teach my child. And I always think, well, okay, and you know what, some other family that's teaching their child at home, their child is going to do better than your child, and there's nothing I can do apart from trying to persuade you, you know, uh, there are some kids who are strongly supported by their families at home, doing extra work at home, reading with their children at home, uh, getting them prepared for their exams every time they have a set of exams, etc. And there are other families who farm their children out to the state and say, get to it. You know, all I can do is advise families and say, look, that's a silly decision if you just leave it up to the state. You know, you have got to look after yourself too. It's sort of like um, health. You know, the fact is, you can just keep eating chocolate all the time and never do any exercise, never eat any greens. And then you can go to the doctor and you can say, well, it's for you to make me well, so give me some pills. Well, he can do that, but you're going to get less and less well over time. Ultimately, <laughs> we are responsible for ourselves. And yes, the state should help with that. And yes, the state should provide education. And obviously, my whole life has been about state education, so it's not like I don't believe in it. But the fact is, parents need to play their part. And I think far too often we don't, we don't. We just don't play the part that we're meant to be playing as adults in children's lives. Catherine Burblestein, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. Thank you for having me. So, Catherine, um, this is the strongest reaction from other people I've had about a guest since um, Nick Cave, obviously, uh, but for a slightly different reaction. Um, I think I probably know a lot of teachers, and uh, Catherine is she's a really controversial figure. And um, when you get a reaction like that of people going, "Ooh, you know, uh, what would they be like?" Um, 
I was take it as a sort of interesting bit of data and and almost always uh the same thing happens that happens with every guest that you start with this public narrative this kind of two-dimensional cartoon of a person in your head and then you encounter them and that cartoon begins to become much more multi-dimensional much richer much more interesting um I'm I'm interested that she said truth um and as her sacred value and um I have this kind of running thing that most people's sacred values group into these three categories of uh, goodness, truth, and beauty, which is the kind of um, Thomas Aquinas theological uh, model for what one of the models for what God is like. And um, this is not at all scientific, so um, don't uh, interrogate my rigor here, but. I do think that there's a bit of a pattern about what people's sacred sacred values are. They tend to cluster. And there are some things that don't fit into these. But I would put kind of truth or people say reason or people say kind of intellectual honesty or things like that. Um, Often those kind of people have found their way into scientific careers or academic careers, philosophers, um, that kind of interest group. And so it's really interesting to me that a head teacher um, came out with that. There's a whole other swathe of people who say something along the lines of goodness or love. I don't think love is necessarily a proxy for goodness, but I'm going to botch it for the sake of my model. Um, love, goodness, kindness, decency to each other, like treat each other how you'd like to be treated. That comes out a lot. And those, um, again, this is very generalized, but often those people are coming from a kind of more um, caring uh, professions or backgrounds in which that kind of pastoral attentiveness to other people is a real driver for them. And then there's a third cluster, which is quite, which is rarer uh, around beauty, but within that I would put kind of awe and mystery and curiosity and space. Pippa Evans, one of our very early guests who's an improviser, said space. And it's always really uh, been interesting to me. And and it, it people with a slightly more creative bent do, I think, tend to, um, uh, their sacred values often sit there. Um, so yeah, truth. And that kind of makes a lot of sense. Truth and children as, as Catherine's sacred values. Just on that, actually, I'd love to know if, um, if listeners have a sense of where their sacred value would fit in that kind of trinity, and then if you have a sense of where it would fit, if you had to kind of pick one, uh, do you find it easier or harder to listen to, listen to people who who fall somewhere else on that little model? Um, I have a hunch that we might, that it might be one of the ways we do the kind of people like us tribal thing. Um, Catherine's clearly a tra- campaigner, right? Uh, many guests, I think, who are quite adversarial out in the public square, like arguing their point all the time, take a beat to shift into a more personal, reflective space. Um, and Catherine certainly did that. Although I did feel we get we got um, a bit more of her as a human. So fascinated by this kind of human nature thing. I think it's so what divides progressive and conservatives, how much emphasis we put on kind of original goodness rather than original sin. And I would want to to, to hold those two things together so tightly and not not give in to the binary. Um, but yeah, this sense of uh, what your vision of the human is, is fr- from which everything else flows. And actually, if you haven't checked out um, our sister podcast, Reading Our Times, Nick Spencer is obsessed with this question. And he's always asking um, kind of ideas people to, to pop the bonnet a bit about what their vision of a human is. Um, yeah, I would re- I would highly recommend that. I won't go down that rabbit hole. I came away thinking about, I mean, Catherine's clearly very charismatic and very persuasive and very passionate. And I really did get a sense of her as a person of goodwill, as someone who was strongly motivated um, by the welfare of children. It is quite extreme, some of her policies, or they seem quite extreme to me. Um, But that overarching thing is if you have good behavior, then the learning environment for everyone is better. If you have good behavior, and this is not an argument she brought up here, but she used, she's used it a lot elsewhere that you stamp out bullying instantly, which is again, a very, um, it's a compelling argument. And I don't need to pick a side about an educational philosophy and I'm not an expert. Um, so I won't, but 
the thing I wish I'd talked to her about is does this does this work for different children differently? My sense is even as adults, we are so temperamentally different, right? And some people really value structure and planning and clarity about what's going to happen next and what's required of them. And they really flourish in that environment. And some people, myself included, um, uh, do not like being told what to do and are very self-directed and um, like the ability to be spontaneous. And I see it in even just between my two children and, and in a lot of children, I wonder how much actually there's a very valid approach that works for some children, but that might really not work for other children and how you might navigate that. I was left with this impression of someone who actually has a really mischievous side, a sort of scrappy rebel stealing the television, uh, paying, you know, trying to save up for a television from her dad, who is really passionate about what she does. And that's so helpful when you have a caricature of a kind of media monster, actually, in some sen- some bits of the progressive media to see that human and that motivation. Um, so really enjoyed getting to know Catherine a little bit. That is all from this episode of The Sacred. The Sacred is a project of the think tank Theos. You can find out all about it at theosthinktank.co.uk. Our production team are Daniel Turner and Lizzie Harvey, and we're edited by Drew Hawley. Our wonderful music, a few people have been asking recently, was an original composition by Lizzie Harvey and Luke Stanley. And the vocals are also by Lizzie Harvey, so she's a multi-talented woman. I think that's all from me this week. Do go and sign up for The Sacred Live as soon as you can. I would love to see you there. Meanwhile, speak to you next episode. Mm